Nikki, I wanted to follow up with you on something I thought was super interesting that he said. So he commented that he has this ability to defend, literally defend President Trump, and to recognize that all these cases that are against him right now have no basis in law, but that he'll be voting Democrat in 2024. I really admire that Dershowitz has the ability to see when somebody's rights are being violated, someone who he doesn't agree with politically, but he can still defend that person and advocate for that person on national TV, and yet um, vote for somebody different, say I don't politically align. His identity is not wrapped up in it. Why do you think that so many Americans have a hard time doing that? There's this whole Trump derangement syndrome that we keep hearing about, where people are so angry, like um, vitriolically angry about President Trump that they destroy friendships over it and uh, get so worked up, you know, never Trumpers and can't say anything positive or, or see things clearly to even to even acknowledge the decline of the American judicial system or the weaponization of our law enforcement systems against somebody that actually affects every American regardless of political position. Why can't more Americans see things like Alan Dershowitz with an apolitical lens when it comes to constitutional rights and civil liberties and instead are so politically divided? Yeah, I mean, that's a that's an excellent question. I I don't know that I have the answer to it. I have thoughts on it. What? <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I think part of it is that we uh, we have a, a younger generation coming up that hasn't been taught a lot about thinking critically for themselves. Mm. There's been a lot of indoctrination. I mean, we see it with our kids in school. You know, the things that they're being taught K through twelve, and then you know our own kid in university and. Um, when there's a lot of indoctrinate, indoctrination and not a lot of critical thinking, when you're being told what to think, not how to think, Such or, a good point. or why you should come to, why you should believe what you, what you do, when you're not placed in an environment where it's safe for people to have views that are perhaps controversial and be able to talk about them, then, then you have an issue with, you know, people later on being able to like, you know, Connect and and dialogue on things that are uh, that they that they're passionate about in a way that's that's healthy and constructive. I also think that there's on some level uh, we're dealing with sort of high school writ large in a way uh, that the social pressure mm. that that people experience in whether it's in a professional environment, whether it's the bombardment from you know from the media, social media, you know everybody wants to feel like they're they're a good person. Um, we all do, and and so nobody wants to be on the wrong side, right, of a particular political issue, and so I think it just it it causes us to draw the battle lines a lot more um, starkly, and we get caught in a zero sum, you know, debate uh, as a result. But having these dialogues with people like Professor Dershowitz, who you know, we have our political differences with him, but we also agree with him on the fundamentals, which is what as Americans should be uniting all of us, right? To your point, on the fundamentals. Like everybody should be entitled to to process. Nobody should be prosecuted right. and gone after because of their political positions and because of what they believe. And we all know that's what's happening with President Trump. I don't know why people actually think that that this that's being done to him is, is just going to be sort of a, a one-off and would, would, would never happen right. again. I think there's, on some level, we're, we're choosing to be a little bit naive about it and thinking, well, in, in just this one case, you know, the ends justify the means. And that's just never true. sounds a lot true. like 1933. It's never true in politics. It's right. never true. Once you open that Pandora's box, mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's, it's done. And so, uh, I still think we have hope. Like we can still rein this in. I think the uh, the Supreme Court has, has 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 done that with the decision that it it, it rendered recently on. Um, yeah, nine people with very different political views and jurisprudence, very different ways of reading the Constitution, all agree mm -hmm. this has gone too far. Right, and I think those kinds of things will help to sort of cabin us in a little bit as a country and remind us, hey, no, this is who we are, not. Not this other stuff. Mm -hmm. Like we are a people who agree on these fundamental values, 
and we are not going to sacrifice those values for what we perceive as a short-term gain, whether we're Republicans or Democrats, Independents, Socialists, whatever political stripe we may be, whatever religious affiliation we may have, whatever economic status we may be in. That's not what we do. I really like your analogy of the lunchroom, or the high school analogy, because it reminds me of a high school lunchroom, where everyone kind of based their identity on where you sit at lunch, right? And so, well, you sit with this table, that table, and you kind of get into this tribalism concept. Instead of thinking about why you ever sat at the table to begin with, and we also maybe remember, if you can brush off your high school memory, there were times you switched tables because of either a change in the friend group or a change in your circumstance, and that that's still an option, that you can be open enough, like Dershowitz would pick up his tray and go sit at Trump's table to figure out how to defend him. That doesn't mean that that's who he's voting for, for student body president, but he's savvy enough to be able to sit at a lot of different tables in the lunchroom. That it doesn't have to be your social identity. Your lunchroom table doesn't have to become your school identity. And I think that that's part of what we've fallen into is just a lot of hyper tribalism instead of identifying ourselves by values. Reminds me of a conversation I've been having a lot with the kids who are saying, you know, okay, mom, so because especially with primary season and everything that came up, um, are we Republican? And I was like, whoa, hold up on that. I say, you know, um, those are really loose terms because if we look back through history of America, the values of the Republicans and the values of the Democrats have really changed on us. And we just need to be very careful. I don't want to ingrain in our kids that we are sit at this lunchroom table because if the values of the Republicans change significantly over the course of those kids' lifetime, I don't want them saying, well, mom said to sit at this table. And then it turns out that the party is actually standing for and advocating for things that we never actually believe. Mm -hmm. It really comes down to, like you're saying, um, how do you think? What, What are those paradigms and those values by which you believe? And it turns out we actually have a lot more in common with people who might call themselves by a different party or even call themselves by a non-party. And that's what can unify the country. If you can actually move past, you, you're probably not going to agree with everybody on much. You and I don't agree on everything politically. That's okay. I'm not looking for assimilation. And I'm not looking for people to say, oh, you have to completely agree You know, the indoctrination. We're looking for uh, unity and affinity. And that's what, you know, kind of these, that's why you have a party platform, these platform points. Can we agree on these principles, how we think about things? Because when it comes to forming policy and making decisions, you have to run a proposed legislation or am I going to support a candidate through a set of values? I think we've gotten away from what are those values that we really advocate, you know, as a country, what unifies us? There's people out there, even people in elected positions right now at the national level who are, who are espousing non-American values. They just absolutely go against our Constitution. And as Dershowitz said, leaders in our country who are now really advocating and promoting fundamentally un-American values, using our, our American systems to push un-American values. And we've got to be united around some basic principles here. Do we or do we not support free speech? Do we or do we not, let's just back it up, support mm-hmm. freedom? Do we or do we not support truth? Just like basic truth. And if we do support those things, then it has to be for everybody. And everybody. not just everybody except this one person here who we think is who a we danger disagree or with. who we disagree with right. or who we don't like. Um, that's, how, that's how democracies get upended. That's, that's how freedom correct. gets. Well, speaking of democracy, do we or do we not support a government led by the people instead of the government led by unelected bureaucrats who unilaterally decide this person's not going to be on the ballot, or a government led by a judicial system with no accountability, or a government led by a weaponized um, law enforcement system. This is becoming very scary, un-American stuff that we really need to guard against. And and we were faced with this last year, an, an interesting decision that kind of came to our doorstep. Whose job is it to guard against those things? There's no nonprofit organization swooping in to save you. There's no 
police force that's going to swoop in when they, when they come for your constitutional rights. No police force is coming in to swoop in to save you. The media is not going to go, hey, wait, you know, your constitutional rights are being violated. It, it fundamentally comes to each individual American to, 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 to take, a, take a stand. That's a tongue twister. <laughs> take a stand and to say, uh, I'm going to defend my constitutional rights against what is an erosion by the government right now. Mm-hmm. And that's what's so important in this time. And that's what Alan Dershowitz has done, you know, throughout his career. Uh, he's been one of those uh, paragons of what that looks like. Mm-hmm. You know, one of, one of those examples of what it, what it looks like to be consistent. Whether you agree with the legal positions he's taken or not, that's a totally different issue. But he's been consistent in what he believes the Constitution says, how he believes it should be applied. Right. And he, he and that's what he's taught, you know, his students, that's what he's advocated for. Right. Um and and I think that's what's also enabled him to, you know, you opened up the segment with that, with that question, you know, how he's been able to say, I'm not gonna vote for Trump, but I am going to defend him uh, and his his constitutional rights. Because if I don't to the extent I, I mean, he didn't say this, but this was this is the the underlying principle. To the extent I say, I'm going to let um, this person get attacked on this issue and say it's okay, then I'm I'm sort of undermining my rights as well because right. I'm basically giving other people the justification to do the same to me.